Hi everybody! Welcome to Ireland! Yay! We're in Ireland! You'll have to excuse, I'm going to talk about some some things. I might use some Irish words and my Irish pronunciation is really terrible, so I hope you'll forgive me for that ahead of time. But yes, we are in uh, the parish of Kilglass in County Ross, Common Ireland, out in the boondocks in the farming community. Um, so I feel right at home here. There's lots of sheep, there's lots of fields, there's lots of plants, there's not very many people. <laughs> so I'm perfectly at home and enjoying myself very much here in Kilglass. Um, my beautiful setting, which I'll show you some pictures of, is an Airbnb that we're uh, renting here on Kilglass Lake. It's a beautiful spot. I'll show you some of the views and some of the cool interiors here. But what I want to talk about today is the uh, Shinron gown, part of the project. Happy St. Patrick's Day, by the way. Wearing my green, wearing my, my uh, Irish earrings. Um, it is St. Patrick's Day, and I am in Ireland on St. Patrick's Day which I never in a million years thought would actually happen. So very pleased about that. Um, hope you'll come along with me and join me for my little trip. So um, just briefly, I know I've talked about this a lot, a lot, a lot, but I am working on a project called the Shinron gown. I've already made the underdress for the Shinron gown. I wanted to wait until I came back from my trip to actually work on the construction of the Shinron gown because I wanted to be able to see the original garment, which I was able to do on this trip. So just as a little bit of background, the Shinron gown is one of the oldest extant uh, pieces of clothing from Ireland that we actually have a physical representation of. And so this uh, dress originally was found in Shinron, which is in County of Folly, in um, the central part of Ireland, was found in a bog, was found inside a bag in the bog. Um, I'll talk about that at some other point about, about that. But they date this tentatively into the late 1600s, early 1700s. Because of the climate in Ireland, fabrics degrade quite quickly, and so there are not a lot of extant garments from Ireland from earlier than that period. And why do I care about the Shinron gown? Why is it important to me? Well, I have Irish ancestry and I've done some actual like deeper DNA kinds of analyses done on my, on my DNA. And um, my maternal lines go back in Ireland at least 2000 years. And so I was trying to recreate a garment from the oldest, farthest back Irish women's garment I could find because my Irish women go so far back in time. Now that's just a few hundred years ago, so it's not as far back as my Irish ancestry actually is in Ireland, but, um, but it's the oldest that I could find. So that's been super important to me. I am also a sheep farmer and I, I grow wool. And this last year I actually experimented with growing some linen. And I'm very interested in the fiber arts and fiber um, history, the agricultural aspects of fiber production. And so that's been of great interest to me as well. And the Shinron gown is made out of wool, hand, of course, back in those days, everything was hand woven, hand spun, hand dyed, dyed with natural uh, colors. And so that's something else that I'm very interested in about this gown. So I have an ancestor that we've traced back to this very place in Ireland, um, Parish of Kilglass in County Roscommon. Her name, variously, there's about six, about 48 different variations of her name, and so we're not sure how she would have pronounced her last name, but in this neighborhood, there's a family name of Ty, T-I-G-H-E, and we think she may have used that spelling. She actually used a different spelling when she moved to Minnesota later in her life, um, she spelled her name M-C-T-E-G-E. -E. So we think that she probably would have pronounced her name Mary Ty, and that that got changed to Mac Teague when she was in Minnesota. 
And so this project is in honor of her and my my I other Irish grandmothers. Mary Ty was my fourth great grandmother. She came from this very place in Ireland. And so it's been just a real joy to be here and be in the place where she actually walked, to walk the, wa the places that she walked. Um, we have been up to the church where she went to church. It's been just a really exciting trip that way. So on our way here, we actually visited the National Museum of Archaeology, National Museum of Ireland Archaeology Department. Um, and that is the place where the original Shenron gown is actually on permanent display. And so I'm going to show you some, some uh, video of that. It is quite dark, so I apologize for that. You won't be able to see particularly well, but I will try to do some editing and lighten those photographs up a little bit so that you can see some of the details. But there were some details that I noticed about the dress in the National Museum. My first impression was wow, that lady was a lot shorter than I thought. <laughs> so there are some very bad pictures online <laughs> of the Shinron gown. I believe probably those photographs were taken in the 40s or 50s or maybe early 60s, but the photographic quality is quite poor and they are black and white photos. And so it's very difficult to tell very much about the gown from those photographs. There have been some other people who did reproductions of this dress. Um, I believe that they were probably using the same pattern that I plan to use, which is from Reconstructing History. Um, those dresses are... Um, I, I don't know very much about who did those reconstructions, or but um, they, they look good. They look, they look quite good. I'm very proud of other people who have tried to do this dress, because it is a little challenging. Um, some other details that I noticed about the original dress. That the fabric was actually a herringbone twill. And I was very interested in seeing that fabric up close. I'm not a spectacular weaver, but I have taken some weaving classes and I recognized um, from the beginning that it was probably going to be a twill weave, just knowing something about the history of the fabric making around in this area. And that, um, that proved true. So I had purchased some herringbone twill wool to create the reconstruction from, and that uh, fabric was actually quite close to what I found on the original garment. Now it's not hand woven, not hand spun, but and it does have a little bit of a different drape which I'll talk about in a minute, but um, but that actually is quite close to the original garment. So I, yay for me, I bought some fabric that was that was pretty darn close to what the original looks like. The shoulder attachment actually, we've talked about this a little bit, the shoulder attachment is strange. Um, instead of the, the sleeve, which is just a strip basically coming down the arm, instead of that being mounted on the top of the shoulder, it's uh, according to the Reconstructing History pattern, it's shifted back and attached to a gusset on the back. I wasn't able to get to see the top part of the shoulder of this dress very well. It's not very well lit in the National Museum but it does appear to be shifted farther forward than I assumed, so that was something to take note of. Um, the, the hem and the sleeve edges were really interesting to me. They looked like they had been torn along the grain and not worn off. There is a section in the front of this dress that is worn, but most of the edges, the, the, the sleeves are supposed to come down and attach somehow at the wrist, and that part of the garment is missing. But the edge between that, um, where the existing garment ends and where the part that's missing begins, is actually torn on the grain. It's not stretched like it would be if it was torn, so I'm puzzled by that. But I do think that perhaps what might have happened is they um, pulled pulled it off as a fabric to use for something else. Um, the hem is also like that, and because, like I say, that dress was quite short, I wonder if there were some other attached sections along the bottom of the hem. Um, there are some details about the skirt that make me think that maybe that isn't the case, but we'll talk about that when we get to the construction video. Now the cartridge pleating was also something that I wanted to look at very carefully on the Shinron gown in the original um, because I wasn't, 
I'm not a super good seamstress and I'm not absolutely positive what cartridge pleating is versus other kinds of pleating. So, um, so I was interested in looking in how that was actually done. And that cartridge pleating is quite soft and it's not particularly regular. It's not super um, consistent throughout the dress. So, so that will make it easier for me <laughs> as an amateur to, to try to get that right. Um, the color of the original is kind of a warm, dark brown. Um, it is, like I say, quite poorly lit, but I was pretty able to get a good sense of what the color is about. Um, some of that brown may be darker than it actually was originally because that uh, bog conditions would have dyed, the, the organic matter in the bog would have dyed that fabric a darker color and a browner color than it probably was originally, but it looked like it actually was probably either a warm brown. I see it just wasn't red enough to have been any kind of red before. But having played with some natural dyeing, um, I think that it probably was just a slightly lighter color of brown before it was put in the bog. The weight of the fabric was something else that I was really interested in looking at. It, it's, um, I, a few years ago, I actually took a hand weaving, a, a hand spinning class, and we reconstructed a historic fabric called Bayes, which is um, a, a fabric that in that case had been imported from Spain uh, to the Netherlands, I believe the original piece of fabric was. Um, that Bayes fabric was also traded into Mexico in the Spanish period and dyed red frequently. And that actually, that fabric was actually um, taken apart. When the Apaches would raid the Spanish settlements, they really liked that red color and they didn't have a red, like a clear red dye um, themselves. So that what they would do is they'd unpick the threads from the original Bayes fabric or Bayeta in Spanish that fabric, that red color was super popular. And that's why there was red color in many of the, um, the Navajo blankets early on because that bays fabric had been unpicked, the red bays. And so I'm kind of familiar with that bays fabric. And this fabric that the Shinron gown was made out of was very interesting to me because I could see the weave and I could see the individual threads in that original garment. And they were a little bit heavier, spun a little bit thicker than the Bayes fabric that I had worked on before. But the funny thing about that handwoven fabric is it's got this very soft drape to it. And I think that my store-bought is gonna be a little bit stiffer than this, um, than the, the original fabric was. So that the store-bought fabrics are woven, in this case, just a little bit tighter and therefore not draping quite so nicely. So that is gonna be something that's gonna be slightly different with this project. On the original, um, on the original Shinron gown, there was no sign of any button attachment or buttonholes or eyelets, sewn eyelets or anything like that on the front. Um, I do believe, I have some specific beliefs about this garment that I will elaborate on when we get to the construction video as far as certain details about the construction. But, um, but that was puzzling to me because I believe that this dress was actually worn and it was actually probably worn a lot. And I find it interesting that I there was no like places where the tension was pulled on the fabric. I don't know if you've sewn buttons onto a garment before, you know that the just the action of that pulling just to sew it on will sometimes distort the fabric somewhat in that area where the button's being sewn. But definitely if there was lacing on those buttons, then there would have been tension on those places. And I could find no evidence at all on the original that that was actually the case, that the fabric was distorted or, or pulled in any way. So that's a, a little bit of a conundrum to me. So the cool thing is 
that serendipitously. I mean, I, my main purpose in coming to Ireland was actually to do my ancestor's genealogy, Mary Ty's genealogy, <clears throat> and try to find some family members of hers. But this entire trip has been full of serendipity, <laughs> okay? There's been a lot of very cool things happening with uh, meeting people, with getting information in per certain places. So serendipity has been a big part of this whole trip. We decided to go visit a site called Rothkrochen. In, uh, it's in an, another site near Tulsk in County Roscommon. That is actually the seat of the kings of Connacht, the ancient kings, kings of Connacht. And um, especially a character in history, kind of mythological history, named Queen Maeve. And she was a super powerful woman who commanded armies and commanded that things happen. There's lots of cool stories about her that I could elaborate on, but this video is about <laughs> Rothkrochen and the site. And so we went and visited this archaeological site. It's super cool. If you ever get a chance to come here, definitely go to Rothkrochen and take the tour, the museum tour, because it's just fabulous. Um, there's a powerful womanly theme in that, in all of those sites. Um, Queen Maeve is quite prominent. So as we turn a corner, my mom actually, I was looking through some things in the little museum, and it's a tiny little museum. It's not very big. And I had noticed coming in that they had some reconstructed clothing of a man's outfit from the medieval period in the doorway. And I thought, well, that's super cool. So I took a bunch of pictures of that thinking, I'm a clothing geek and here we are. This is very cool, some reconstruction. Well, I'm looking through the other items in the museum and my mom says, uh, Terry, you need to come over here. <laughs> and lo and behold, Someone had done a reconstruction of the Shinron gown, and it's sitting in the Rothkrochen Museum. And so there, right there in front of me, with no glass case around it, there was an actual reconstructed version of this Shinron gown. So, very fun, very cool. I will share some pictures of that with you. Though, um, the reconstruction that I found there is generally quite close to the reconstructing history pattern. And I think it was probably used in that reconstruction. Now, I have to qualify this. The woman, the, the model that the, the mannequin that this dress is displayed on also has on a woven cloak over the top of this dress. So I didn't get to see, for example, the shoulder construction. I didn't get to see anything about the sleeves. That was all covered by the cloak. But I could see the front and I could see the, the skirt and the attachments there. So as far as I could tell, it was very close to the reconstructing history pattern. The color of the reconstruction is uh, kind of a muted red or burgundy color. It's not quite dark enough to be burgundy, but, but I will show some pictures and you'll get a good sense of the color. Um, the length, it looks to me like they actually added strips. Uh, decorative strips around the bottom of the skirt. And so this is why I think, well, there are other reasons why. The, the, um, the very even hem around the original made me think that perhaps there were other le um, levels of trim on the bottom of that skirt, but this actually, this reconstructionist um, interpreted the dress that way, and there were several uh, ruffle layers on the bottom of the skirt added. Um, the, the, the fabric type that the reconstructionist used for this reconstruction at Rothkrochen um, was not using a herringbone twill. It was more of a solid 1-1 uh, weave fabric. And it was a very similar weight to the original dress. Um, Maybe again slightly stiffer, but it was actually pretty, pretty um, drapey, drapier than uh, my store bought fabric, for example. The sleeve ends were not visible under the cloak, as I said. Um, this reconstruction seems to be bulkier at the waist pleat attachment area, um, and it's and it pulls in some really kind of awkward ways, and I'll show you some pictures of that as we go along. 
Um, I am actually interested in trying to figure out how the pleats were attached in a way that doesn't create that kind of bulky look and um, the, the kind of distortion that's happening there. Um, it does, this reconstruction has buttons and um, alternating lacing, and I'll show you a picture of that so you know what I mean. It's not exactly spiral lacing. It's not exactly, it's definitely not like modern crisscross lacing, but, um, and I don't know. I'm not an expert. I'm an enthusiastic amateur, so I don't know what some of these terms mean, but I do know that this is a very strange kind of lacing that she used in the reconstruction, or he whoever did this, this reconstruction at Roth Crokin. The accessories and shoes are really interesting. They were interpreted from other drawings from the 1500s of Irish clothing. And I recognize those drawings from drawings that I've been using to, um, as reference material for this, this project I've been working on. So the other cool thing is they had a couple of other reconstructions at this site. They had um, a couple of men's outfits that they reconstructed. I'll, I'll post some pictures of that. I do think that they, there was some confusion in the, in the first um, reconstruction that you see when you walk into the museum. There's a sign right next to the display that says it was Iron Age or Bronze Age. I can't remember. I'll, po I'll post it so you can see it that the clothing reconstruction seems to be related to that, but these were actually late medieval um, Irish reconstructions. And both of the men's uh, reconstruction uh, sets of garments are from that period, because that's the earliest um, records that we have on those kinds of, clo on those kinds of men's clothing. So an interesting detail that I thought was cool that they, they reconstructed in some of these was on swords, and this is something I just recently found out, on swords from the period, there was a very distinctive ring-shaped hilt. So on the handle of the sword, so say the sword is coming out here, then you have the, the um, hand guard here, then the sword handle comes out here, it's wrapped, and but the the I think it's called the tang. The tang comes out from the actual metal part of the sword and then it ends in a ring. And that is, I don't know, something that I just have been finding interesting lately from a weapons perspective, that ring shaped end on the, on the hilt of the sword. So I did, I was, wasn't able to find out at the site who the reconstructing person was, who was doing these reconstructions at the Roth Crokin Museum, but they actually took my email address and I may get word from that person. And so that would be super cool as I'm working on this reconstruction. Um, so stay tuned, we're gonna have more. The reconstruction video will come out, I believe probably in about three or four weeks after this video is made, I've got another uh, five or six days here in the in Ireland and um, and I do want to have some substantial time to work on the dress it is going to be entirely hand sewn so that's going to take me some time it's got 23 panels in the skirt that's going to take a long time so I want to give myself plenty of time to actually do the reconstruction but I thought I would give you a little update and show you some pictures of the reconstructions that we found and the pictures of the original garment. So bye-bye, we'll see you later and look forward to some more videos very soon.